Thank you very much. Praise God. You can be seated. Well, what an honor to be with you today. I believe that God is going to change people's lives today. I'm going to be sharing with you the second most important encounter I ever had with the Lord, and it has radically revolutionized my life. And I believe that this is going to be a special time for you. That, you know, God's got a plan for every one of us, and it's always greater than what any of us know. God believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. And I believe that today we're going to really share some things to help you. Let me just say that I appreciate Pastor Mark. Uh, you know, he's the very first person I ever met in Colorado Springs back in 1979. We happened to be sitting next to each other. So I met him actually before I moved here. And uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I shared with Mark these things that I'm going to be sharing with you today. We were eating a meal and I just shared how that the Lord had touched me. And man, it lit a fire under Mark. And Mark has become a part of our Karis Bible College and uh, directs our School of Practical Government. And I tell you what, it's awesome. It's awesome. They have had a wonderful time. They've been to the state capitol here and they're going to Washington, D.C. Uh, next week. And I tell you, we're turning out leaders that are making a difference. And your pastor, Pastor Mark, is just an awesome awesome blessing. I know that you know that, but I wanted to just say that publicly and thank him for everything he's done. So today I'm going to be talking about don't limit God. I've got a book on this and I've got CDs on it. I've also got a study guide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that because I've got a lot to say this morning, but let me just say that if God does touch you and if uh, he speaks something to you and you say, man, I need more of that. I've got a lot of material out there that will cover all of that. Let me turn over to Psalms chapter 78 and verse 41. And this is a passage that I preached on many times, but then on January the 31st, 2002, I had an encounter where God spoke this directly to me. And it's talking about the children of Israel and all the things that they went through. And I just want to pull out verse 41. It says, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And, you know, I want to make a special mention, even if you're watching this, you know, on one of the other campuses in Littleton, Southwest down there, I believe that every one of us limits God. And there's so much I'd like to say about this. I'm just going to say some things very quickly. I may quote a lot of scriptures rather than turn to them because I can cover more territory. But let me say that there, some people believe in fate, or if you're Christian, they believe in the sovereignty of God, that God just supernaturally controls everything, and that whatever God's will for you comes to pass. That is not true, and I can prove that in a million ways, but this verse right here proves it. It says they limited God. God never intended for the children of Israel to spend 40 years in the wilderness, that wasn't God's will. That was because they didn't believe God. They didn't trust God. And because of it, they experienced things that were not God's will. And so the very first thing I want to say is that, you know what? God's will does not automatically come to pass. God has a plan for every single person in here. God has never made a piece of junk. There is nobody in here who's a mistake and regardless of what your life has been like, I can guarantee you God has a perfect plan for you. And God is better than any GPS system you could ever buy. Then, I mean, you know, if you make a wrong turn with GPS, they say recalculating, and they can get you back on track. God can recalculate your life. God can take whatever mistakes and whatever has happened to you and actually work it together for good. But God has a plan for you. And I believe that most people are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. And there's multiple reasons for that, and I'm going to be sharing some of that with you. First of all, I want to just share with you what's happened to my life since January the 31st, 2002. And please don't misunderstand. The only reason I'm sharing this is to show you that this isn't theory with me. This is something that has changed my life. I am not bragging on myself. I'm bragging on Jesus. Man, it works. You know, uh, my mother died in 2009. She was 96, and right before she died, I was sharing with her. She was asking about how the ministry was going, and I was telling her different things, and she looks at me, and she says, Andy, you know that's God. 
And I said, yes, ma'am, I know that's God. And she says, you aren't smart enough to do that. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. I am taking no credit for anything. All I'm, I'm like on a roller coaster. I'm just strapped in and holding on for dear life. But God is doing some awesome, awesome things in my life. So I want to share with you that on January uh, the 31st of 2002, at that time we had 68 employees. And the Lord told me I was limiting him. I was limiting what he could do in my life because of my small thinking. And at that time we had 28 employees. Now we have over 638 employees. Yeah. And again, I'm saying this just to say, man, it works. Yeah. That's the only reason I'm saying this. Did you know that there's only 3% of companies in the United States that have more than 500 employees. And in 15 years, we've come from 28 to 638. We had two Bible schools, the one here, and then we had one in England. Now we have over 72 with another, I don't know, eight or so coming on board this year. Uh, we had 3% of the U.S. population that we covered by television, and then we had God TV that was international, but it was just getting started. Now we are on, I couldn't even tell you, but we're on every network that you can be on. We're on hundreds of individual stations, and we cover 3.2 billion people per day with the gospel. And again, I'm saying this just to say that, man, look what happens when you begin to take the limits off God. And many of you don't realize it. You may be praying for breakthrough, but breakthrough doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside. And I had been in ministry for a long time. I just uh, celebrated last uh, Thursday it was my 49th anniversary of my encounter with the Lord. And I've been in ministry for 49 years. And I had been on television since January of 2000, and we were seeing growth. We had actually doubled from January of 2000 up until 2002, and I thought I was doing okay, but I knew that God's vision for me and my life was bigger than what I was experiencing, and there were reasons why it wasn't working. And it wasn't anything out there. It was all inside of me. And I want to make this application to you that it is not what other people are doing to you or anything out here. You know, there are people thinking, if I just had the government give me more money, if I just had an education, if I just had this, if the color of your skin was different, and we blame all of these things, and we sit here and say that I can't change, I can't see what God really has for me because of these things. The moment you do that, you make yourself a victim, not the victor. You can't change people. You know, President Trump is learning that you just can't do what you want to do. <laughs> you you got to work with people, and there's other things, and you can't change other people. But you have 100% control over you, or you should have. You can have. Let me say not everybody exercises it, but we have that potential. You know, when the Lord spoke this to me, I called my staff together, and like I said, we had 28 employees. I called my staff together on February the 11th, 2002, and I said, I don't know how long it takes to change, but I'm going to quit thinking small. I'm going to quit limiting God by what's inside of me. And I said, I don't know if it takes a day, a month, a year, five years, ten years. I don't know what it takes, but I can guarantee you I'm going to change. And did you know I told my staff that in two days, we had been trying to get on the Daystar Network for two years, and Marcus and Joni Lamb were friends of mine. I'd been on their program many times. They, every time I asked them about going on, they quoted me a rate that was higher than their rate card, higher than what anybody else paid. It was like they didn't want me on there. We had been knocking on that door for two years, and I said, I'm going to change. Within two days, I got a letter from Marcus Lamb, and he says, why aren't you on Daystar? He says, forget the money. You give us a program. You start Monday. We will give you a deal that I guarantee you you can accept. And boom, things started changing. We uh, had needed people to help us, and we were just struggling. Jamie was running the entire ministry, and even though she did a great job, it was just a huge burden on us. Within two days, a man called me and took early retirement and said, I'm coming out to take your ministry to the next level. And this was also right after 9-11, and if you remember when 9-11 happened, 
ministries began to experience a huge financial dip because people were looking at the news and wondering what else was going to happen and, you know, out of sight, out of mind, and people quit contributing. This was right after 9-11, and instead of our finances going down, we doubled in finances, and it was before I had time to tell anybody. It takes <coughs> approximately two months to get anything on television from the time we tape it, and I didn't have time to tell them, and before I could tell anybody, before I could do anything, boom, like that, our finances increased. So the point that I'm making to you is, see, it wasn't what was out there. It was inside of me that was limiting God, and brothers and sisters, this is what I'm saying to you, that we limit what God can do in our life because of our own constraints. Nobody else can constrain you. The devil can't stop what God wants to do. Nobody can stop it. You are the one that's stopping it. And some people think, well, boy, what you're saying condemns me. Well, I'm not meaning to condemn you, but you've got to quit blaming other people because, again, you don't have authority over other people. You've got to accept responsibility and recognize I'm the one who's limited. Other people may fight against you and they may say things and try and limit you, but nobody can limit you but you. God will not limit you. Satan cannot limit you. You are the establishing witness. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, Behold, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. You know, this ought to be a no-brainer. Life or death, blessing or cursing. But just in case anybody misses it, he says, choose life. He gives you the answer. <laughs> choose life. And, you know, I know that some of this, it, it may, people are uncomfortable taking responsibility for their life. They find satisfaction in thinking, you don't understand. I was abused when I was a child. This happened, and therefore, this made me the jerk that I am. And you sit there and take solace in blaming somebody else. But I can show you people that have been through things worse than you have that came out better. You have a choice whether you become bitter or better. You may have more obstacles to overcome than I did or somebody else, but it's up to you. And I, this is I, what I'm trying to get across to you, and this is what God spoke to me, <clears throat> that I was the one that was limiting God. So there's multiple reasons. I'm going through all of this very quickly. Man, if, if you, uh, I encourage you to get these materials because I'm saying some things very quickly. But you know what? I had become comfortable. Jamie and I started in ministry in 1968, actually we got married in 72, and I quit my job and we went full-time in ministry. And we struggled, struggled, struggled for a long, long period of time. And finally, when we started on television in uh, January the 3rd of 2000, we began to experience, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but it was easy compared to what I'd done before. The finances were there. We weren't behind. We weren't having collection agencies after us anymore. We saw light at the end of the tunnel, and it wasn't another train. It looked like we were going to live and not die. And you know what? I was enjoying it. And so part of why I was limiting God was because I didn't want to stretch myself. And I think that there's a lot of people that this is one reason you limit God is because you are just out here letting the cares of this life and you're just enjoying life and you aren't pressing. I'm telling you, if you aren't being stretched, if your dreams and visions don't wake you up at night, you're dreaming too small. God made you for something big. God never made anybody to get up and go to work, come home, watch television, go to bed, and then repeat the cycle. You need to be doing something with your life. This isn't a dress rehearsal. It's the real deal. You're burning daylight. Are you, you know, when you die, is anybody going to miss you? Think about that. And I know people don't like to think about this, but you can't change it once you're dead. You're going to have to think about it now. If you want to change things, you need to be making an impact. Not everybody's called to do what I'm doing or what Pastor Mark is doing, but every one of you is called to reach people. You know, I spend millions of dollars a month on television and radio, and every one of you have people that you know that will never hear of me or Pastor Mark or anybody else. You have a realm of influence that nobody else is going to reach. Are you using it? Are you changing people's lives? Is your life counting for something? 
In a way, this is disturbing, but you need to confront it. And many times, people limit God just because they don't want to stretch themselves. Then there's a fear of failure. If you start believing for something beyond yourself, and let me just tell you that if you are doing, if you feel like God has called you to do something that you are gifted, talented, equipped for, and that you can do it, it's just right up your alley. I don't believe you found God's will for your life yet. God's big. God is going to call you to do something that's beyond yourself. If you can do what you are called to do in your own strength and power, you hadn't found God. God's going to call you to go beyond yourself. He's going to choose you to do something that's totally out of the norm. I was an introvert and couldn't even look at a person in the face. I couldn't say hi to a person that I didn't know. And now I speak to millions of people. God called me to do something that made me depend upon him. If you're only doing what you can do, you've missed God. God will call you to do something big. And so, if you know that God has called you for something more, one of the reasons that people limit God is because they're afraid that if I step out of my comfort zone, if I get out of what I can do on my own, I may fail. And you know what? You might but I believe that God looks at things differently than people do. You know, when you teach your child to ride a bike and they fall off the bike, you don't say, you idiot. If you'd have done what I'd have told you, you could have done this. And you don't criticize them. But when they fail, you help them say, hey, you know what? You went 10 feet. Try it again. You can do better. God is not the way that many people have represented him. I believe that you might stretch yourself. And it's possible. It is possible that you can fail. But you know what? God looks at it different. I believe that God will welcome you into heaven and say, man, you went for it. You know, right now, we have built in the last four and a half years $70 million worth of buildings debt-free. And I'm in the process of building $200 million worth of stuff all debt-free. This coming week, we're signing the papers on an additional 336 acres debt-free and we're doing all of these things. And you know what? There's a possibility that I might fail. But I can guarantee you, if I did fail, God would welcome me into heaven and say, Praise God, you went for it. Amen. You know, the Lord told uh, Peter, he says, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. Most people would think, well, that didn't work. But I can guarantee you, Jesus' prayers were answered. People look at that and think, well, Peter failed. He denied the Lord. But that was just one instance. He recovered. He went on. He stood strong. He died a martyr's death. And in God's sight, he didn't fail. God looks at failure differently. If you're doing nothing, if you know that God has more for you and you aren't doing it because you're afraid of failure, you failed. Following God and doing what he tells you to do and failing is not failure. Failure is not doing what you believe. There are many of you that when you get up and go to work, you hate it. You hate it. You talk about Blue Monday and then on Friday, man, TGIF. <laughs> you hadn't found God's will. I was talking to Pastor Ken this morning about Mark. Mark called me this morning and said, man, they're, they're uh, ready to come home. <laughs> says, Linda was ready to come home last week. And you know what? They're taking time off, and that's good. But when you love what you're doing, when you're doing what God called you to do, it's not work. It's not effort. There are some of you that are stuck in dead-end jobs, and yet you will not change because you're afraid you might fail. You've already failed. Forgive me for being blunt. I'm saying these things in love. You know, this is like when you pet a cat against the grain and all their hair stands up. You know how you solve that problem? You just turn the cat around and keep petting. And if what I say has rubbed you the wrong way, the way to respond is just turn around, repent, and this will go to feeling good. But I'm telling you, God made you for something great, and some of you are just afraid to get out of your comfort zone and do anything, and you're going to wind up at the end of your life disappointed, discouraged, thinking, why didn't I go for it? Man, I'm going for it. And I could fail. Did you know I have, I forget, forget what it is now, but I have to have like $5,000 an hour 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year just to pay my bills. And I need twice that much. You know what? If you weren't careful, I could keep you up at night. <laughs> but I'm just doing what God told me to do. And God is meeting my needs supernaturally. Amen. You know, back before the Lord spoke to me, we had doubled, like I told you. And in 2001, our last year before the the Lord spoke that to me. We had um, $2.5 million income in the ministry. This last year, we had $63.5 million. And it all is because I started thinking different. And when I did that, God has meant the need. God has supplied. And we give our stuff away. Over 53% of the people that contact us ask for material, and I don't charge them a thing, and we give it away. We give away the majority of stuff. We've given away well over 100 million books, CDs, DVDs, and things like this. And God has enabled us. I'm telling you, God will come through, but you don't wait until the supply is there and then take a step of faith. You have to take a step of faith, and then the supply comes. <laughs> And so there's people that are just lazy. They're comfortable. They don't want to get out of their comfort zone. There's people who are afraid of failure. There's people who are afraid of persecution. That's a big deal. And you know what, Jamie and I, uh, I knew that if we became larger in our ministry that it was going to open us up to a lot of criticism. I've got thousands of blogs written about what a terrible person I am. And I wasn't looking forward to that. <laughs> and so that was one reason that you limit God. But you know what the biggest thing with me was? I was afraid of success. And some of you won't relate to this, but I have been around ministry for 49 years, and I've seen a lot of people that started out serving God with a pure heart, and when they begin to succeed and when they begin to start having lots of people respond to them, they quit their relationship with the Lord. They got into themselves. And, you know, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. David sinned when it says it was time for kings to go out to battle and he was staying at home sleeping all day and getting up at night. He was bored. I've seen success destroy a lot of people. And my number one thing was I loved the Lord more than I loved anything that, uh, you know, I could accomplish and stuff like this. And I didn't want to lose my relationship with the Lord. And that was really my biggest fear. I was enjoying being under the radar and I didn't, I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to handle it. I didn't have faith in myself, which in a way you aren't supposed to have faith in yourself. But at the same time, you know, the Lord finally got me over this by saying, hey, I've spent, I think at that time it was 30 something years, 32 years preparing you for this. You need to trust me that I can take care of it. And I had to take a step of faith that, God, I'm able to do this, that you will enable me to do it. And I tell you, it was, it was a big deal. There's so much more. There's other things that limit God. But I'm telling you, all of those things, it's not external things. It's stuff inside of you. And you're going to have to overcome this, and you're going to have to stir yourself up. The last thing I wanted to share with you about this is that once I started doing this, because of these different reasons, I had never let myself see me doing what I knew God called me to do. God told me 49 years ago I was going to have one of the largest ministries in the world. And you know what? There was just no point in saying it because, there, I mean, Jamie and I pastored three little churches, and the largest one we ever pastored was 100 people. And that was in a town of 144 people. <laughs> so it was successful percentage-wise, but... That was the largest church. The first church we pastored, 12 people was the most we ever had for two years. And then we jumped up to about 50 in Childress, Texas. And then when we moved to Pritchett, Colorado, we saw a man raised from the dead. And we had 100 coming to church. But it was never large or anything like that. And because of all of this, man, I got to thinking about what I was <laughs> going through. And I forgot where I was going with that. It was a good point. Oh, here's my point. When, you, when you're only ministering to a few people like this and you tell them, God told me I'm going to be reaching people in every corner of the world, people just look at you like, uh, you know what, your elevator doesn't go all the way to the <laughs> top floor. I mean, there was no evidence of it whatsoever. And it's like when you reach over to pet a dog. If every time you do that, the thing bites you, you'll quit petting that dog after a while. 
So I had quit speaking my vision because for one thing, it wasn't time. God spent 32 years preparing me for what I'm doing now, and I just had to abide my time. And I had quit speaking my vision because of people's criticism and rejection. It was hard for me to deal with. But uh, I hadn't allowed myself to really see what God put in my heart. I knew it. If you would have asked me, I could have told you what God's vision for my life was, but I wouldn't allow myself to see it come into pass because of the criticism and just because there was nothing in the natural to verify it. And when the Lord spoke to me January 31st, 2002, one of the very first things I did was I just turned my imagination loose. I got a Holy Ghost imagination and I sat down and started visualizing, imagining how is this going to happen? God, how do I get from where I am to where you want me to be? And I just started thinking about it. And I've got a lot of teaching in this book on this. But in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusted in him. Did you know that the word mind there is the Hebrew word yeser, Y-E-S-E-R, or some uh, deals spell it Y-E-S-T-E-R, and it means conception. And it was translated imagination 13 times in the Old Testament. This is saying that the way you stay in perfect peace is when your imagination, your mind is stayed upon God. Man, I could spend a lot of time on this, but real quickly, let me just say that your mind, you have facts, information in your mind, but you aren't the way you think in just facts. You may, you may know that God called you to do this, that God said this. Let's say, for instance, the Bible says that the same works that Jesus did shall you do also, and even greater works than these. Probably every one of you in here have heard that. And you probably have that piece of information. You might even be able to quote that that's John chapter 14, verse 12. But have you seen yourself raising the dead? Or is it just information? You know, this man that I referred to in Pritchett, Colorado, the Lord gave me John 14, 12 many years ago, and I just thought, God, I haven't seen the people raised from the dead. But you said I would. I'd do the same works that you did. I haven't ever seen a person raised from the dead. So you know what I did? I took all of the scriptures that talked about raising people from the dead, and I studied them until I knew them frontwards and backwards, and then I would not only see Elijah raising the boy from the dead and laying on him and putting his mouth on his mouth, his hands on his hands, and then him waxing warm, and then him walking up and down in the house and doing it again. I not only saw Elijah do it, I saw myself do it. I would, with my imagination, lay on a bed and think, what was it like? How did he do this? When Jesus called Lazarus forth from the dead, I saw Jesus do it, and then I saw me do it. I would, with my imagination, say, I'm going to do the same things that Jesus did. I will see people come out of graves. And I started doing this, and you know, it became so dominant in me that I got to where at night I would dream and see 20 or 30 people a night raised from the dead. And then, once I saw it on the inside, I saw it on the outside. I saw a man raised from the dead with the sheriff standing there. And then many years later, I'd seen two or three other people raised from the dead. Many years later, I thought, you know, it's been a decade since I've seen anybody raised from the dead. I said, it wasn't only good for back in the 90s or something. I said, I'm going to do it again. So I took the scripture. I started meditating on them. And then my own son died. And he was dead for five hours. And they called me and told me, and Jamie and I prayed and agreed, and my son, who was dead for five hours right here in Colorado Springs, in a morgue, in a cooler, stripped naked, with a toe tag on, had pronounced dead, sat up and started talking, and today is just as normal as he can be, as normal as he ever was, raised from the dead. And I can guarantee you that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have seen it. All of you know that, yes, the same works that Jesus did shall you do also. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Do you see yourself laying hands on the sick? Do you see it? Do you talk about it? Do you dream it? If you don't see it on the inside, you won't see it on the outside. 
And there are some of you that have more information from God than what you are imagining. Your imagination, that word, like I said, is conception. That's what the word literally means. Your imagination is where you conceive things. Did you know you can't, you can't, uh, you think in pictures, whether you know it or not. If I say dog, you don't see the letters D-O-G. You picture a dog. And each one of you have a different picture based probably on your own animal or something like that. And I, with words, I can change your picture. Some of you are thinking of a little tiny dog that's got their toenails painted in a bow in their hair and things <laughs> like that. I could change it to talk about a big, mean, black dog. And I could use words and I could change your picture. But you think in pictures. If you can't picture it, you can't retain it. You use your imagination all of the time. You know, if I was to ask you, how many windows do you have in your bedroom? Most of you have never sat down and counted, but you could tell me. You know why? Because you can see it. You could picture it. You could sit there and count them. If I was to ask you how you get from here to the airport, you could say, well, you go out here and you go to this light on powers and you turn. And you know how you're able to give those directions? Because you can see it. You can see it. You can't give directions without an imagination. You can't remember without an imagination. Your imagination is your womb. You were conceived. I'm not going to teach on this. I'll let Mark do this when he gets back. But you, you, the stork didn't bring you. You had to be conceived. <laughs> Amen. And did you know that miracles, some of you are praying for a miracle, but have you ever seen yourself well? Have you ever seen yourself succeeding? Have you ever seen this? And many of you won't allow yourself to go there. You don't do that. Matter of fact, most adults think that this is childish. It's fantasy. Man, there is a fantasy that is unreal, but I'm talking about imagining godly things. You know, there was a woman I heard on the tape that uh, she had real poor eyesight. She could barely see. Her glass, glasses were like the bottom of a Coke bottle. She was legally blind without her glasses. And she had a healing evangelist coming to her church. And uh, she didn't want to be prayed for because she'd been prayed for so many times and nothing ever happened. And so she didn't want to be disappointed again. So she avoided this guy. And finally, he cornered her. And he says, I want to pray for you. So she said, okay. And he made her take her glasses off. And then he prayed for her. And he says, now, can you see? So she started to open her eyes. And he says, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes like, what's, what's he saying? He asked me if I could see. So then he asked the second time. He says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes, and he said, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes, thinking, how am I going to tell if I can see if I don't open my eyes? Finally, the third time, he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes again, and he said, shut your eyes. I didn't ask you if you could see with your physical eyes. Can you see yourself seeing? Can you see it in your heart? And finally, she understood what he was talking about, so she kept her eyes closed, and she just prayed in tongues for five or ten minutes, and she says, I can see it. I can see myself well. And he says, now open your eyes. And she opened her eyes, and she was healed. And see, this is one of the mistakes that we often make. We just pray for a person, and then they open their eyes, or they feel, or they go to the doctor to check, and they are just looking in the natural realm, but they've never seen themselves well. There's some of you praying to be well, but you don't see yourself well. You dream sick. You talk sick. You think sick. And I'm telling you, you aren't going to have a virgin birth. You have to conceive it in your imagination. And just like a woman, when she first gets pregnant, did you know she doesn't even know she's pregnant? It takes a period of time before she realizes it. If you start doing these things, take the limits off God and say, God, I want to see your will come to pass in my life. For a period of time, you may not feel like anything's happening, but I can guarantee you, you are, you are conceiving something. And then a woman will recognize she's pregnant long before anybody else recognizes it. And all of a sudden, you'll know something's changing in my life. I am going to see this come to pass, but nobody else can see it. And then eventually the woman gets to where everybody can tell she's pregnant. And eventually people will start saying, man, I believe with you. And they are just excited. And then you give birth. And when you give birth is not when the conception started. 
Some of us are wanting to give birth to a miracle and see God's will come to pass in our life, and you had never had any intercourse with your imagination and dreams. You need to let God plant a dream in your heart. And I, again, I encourage you to get this teaching because I've gone through this very quickly. But God has a perfect plan for every person. Jeremiah chapter 1, he told Jeremiah, Before I formed you in your mother's belly, before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. It had nothing to do with what he had accomplished and God looking at him and thinking, Oh, you've got this talent, you've got this ability, I'll use you to do this. No, before he was ever formed in the womb, God had a plan for him. Paul said the same thing in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, when it pleased God who separated me unto the gospel from my mother's womb. God had a plan for him from day one. Now, God's plan doesn't automatically come to pass. Again, this is where the sovereignty of God teaching has got it wrong, that they just say whatever God will automatically comes to pass. That's not true. The children of Israel were never intended to die in the wilderness. That wasn't God's will for them, but it did come to pass because they didn't cooperate. But although he doesn't force his will upon you, God has a plan for every person. There's not a one of you that caught by God, God by surprise. You might have surprised your parents. <laughs> they may not have known you were coming, but I guarantee you God was right there. God had a plan for you before you were born. I heard, I think it's Max Lucado, Lucado uh, say this. I'm not sure. But anyway, somebody said, if you want to find the place on the earth that has the most potential, go to a graveyard because the vast majority of people took their potential to the grave. Man, I'm believing that when my time to leave comes, I'm not going to have any juice left in me. I am using it all up. I'm doing everything that God has called me to do. And, you know, we just had some meeting. I had my board meeting, this, my annual board meeting this last Thursday. And the consensus of everybody is we are just now getting traction. We are just now beginning. In the next year, we've been increasing 50% every year in the previous, in the next years. We are looking to do much greater than that. We are just getting started. Man, I got a huge vision. Matter of fact, I was in a church service um, right after this uh, January the 31st, 2002, and the guy was preaching something along these lines about believing God, and if you need a greater vision, stand up. Jamie put her hand on my leg and says, don't you dare stand up. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming big. Paul Milligan, Ken mentioned him, and every, Paul Milligan is the CEO of my ministry, and every time I get to talking about something, I came up with some ideas this last week. He just, he just says, man, he says, you got to dream a minute. I am believing God. God is showing me things. We are doing things. This musical that you saw advertised, we're doing it at the Pike Speak Center. It's going to be performed in Norway. The Vatican has asked for it to be performed in Rome. And we are doing things, and God is just doing awesome, awesome, awesome miracles and I'm telling you, God is bigger than any of us. I can guarantee you God is not in heaven saying, Andrew, don't encourage him too much. Somebody might believe me for more than what I can give. I might not be able to deliver. Man, the Lord's not up there wringing his hands saying, oh, I hope that they just settle for just a normal life. Man, God's wanting you to dream big. We got a big God. Are you making your life count? Are you transforming people's lives? Are you in a dead-end job? Man, you need to do something. Look alive. The buzzards are coming. Man. Do something. Lest you do nothing. Well, I'm afraid I might make a mistake. If you don't do anything, that's the greatest mistake of all. Pastor Ken reminded me of that. I don't remember this, but in 1993, I told Ken and Patsy, I said, how long are you going to sit here? Till you die? That's a quotation from Kings where those four lepers were at the gate of the city and the famine was getting them. And they, if they went into the city, they were going to for sure die of the famine. If they stayed there, they were going to die. They said, let's go out to the enemy. The worst they can do is kill us. And they went out there and they went from zeros to heroes in just a matter of an hour. And God just blessed them abundantly because they finally said, how long are we going to sit here till we die? Do something. Do something. If you don't have a vision, it's not because God doesn't have a vision for you. It's because you have not sought it. 
The Bible says, seek and you shall find. God has a plan for you. Man, the scriptures that changed my life, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be like the rest of the world. Don't be like everybody else. It's just going through the motions and thinking that joy and peace is having a bigger house and a bigger car and more stuff. Don't be conformed to that way of thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You don't go from nothing to finding the perfect will of God all at one time. It's a process. There's the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God. But you've got to get started. It's not up to God. It's up to you. So right now, if you're watching on one of these other campuses, we're going to be turning this back to the campus uh, pastors. But I want to encourage every one of you that God made you for more than what you're experiencing. He made me for more than what I'm experiencing. I hadn't tapped God out. I guarantee you, I'm still believing. God's challenging me. He's challenging every one of you. And Father, right now, I just pray for all of these people. And Father, you in love would show us ways that we've limited you ways that we're afraid to step out and do things, how that we're just being caught up in the things of this world and are distracted and aren't looking at you, or we're afraid of people, afraid of failure, afraid of success. But Father, whatever the problems are, thank you for revealing this to us right now. And Father, I believe that you are imparting vision that people will take this message today and that they will leave here and begin to start taking the limits off God, believing you for something big, believing you for something that is so big it can't be fulfilled in their own strength and power. And Father, we thank you for that. And so we agree, and I believe I planted a seed today that you're going to water and that this will bring forth fruit. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen.